Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. It's my pleasure to uh, reply to the debate on behalf of the Scottish Conservatives. And I think it's been a very helpful and valuable debate. In fact, it may be one of the most important debates we're going to have in this chamber uh, for a long time, because the medium-term financial strategy set out by the Finance Secretary last week sets the uh, uh, trend for uh, government spending for the next four years. And I think it's disappointing, frankly, that having had just a half-hour statement on this last week, it was left to the opposition party to take this debate this afternoon, of course. Cabinet Secretary. He, like every other party, sits on the bureau that sets the timing. Considering every Conservative has raised this in the debate this afternoon, can he accept that it's incumbent on his uh, chief whip to make that point in bureau? Well, Fraser. well, surely it's up to the government of the day to bring to the chamber enough time to debate what could be the most important set of issues facing this parliament over the next four years, presiding officer. But we learned quite a lot uh, in this, in this uh, debate. We learned, first of all, that the SNP don't like the term black hole. So what do we call it? Perhaps we should call it a mismatch, a mismatch between the money coming in and the money that's going out. And this black hole, this situation, this mismatch, is one that is entirely of the SNP's own uh, making. No matter how much they try to deflect away, and all the SNP uh, speeches this afternoon were all characterised by deflection. Yep. It was all about trying to point elsewhere rather than take responsibility. The fact is, it is down to them. We heard, and I'm very disappointed from, uh, in the Finance Secretary, because we heard her once again put forward this claim that there'd be a 5.2% cut in the Scottish Government's budget. She knows that's a dishonest claim, because that is not comparing like with like. She knows, and I'll give away in a second, she knows perfectly well that the budget for the previous year was inflated because of one-off COVID money. And if you take that money out, this budget here in this year is the highest it has ever been. I'll give way again. Cabinet if, he, Secretary. if he calls me dishonest on that statement, he must also call the SFC dishonest, because I'm quoting directly from the Scottish Fiscal Commission. Murdo Fraser. Well, what they're not doing, and what the Cabinet Secretary is not doing, is taking account the one-off COVID money that was in the budget for last year. The reality is the core budget is up. The block grant is up £4 billion on last year. 10% in cash terms, 7% in real terms, the biggest block grant in the history of devolution. And also we know, because the Cabinet Secretary said it in her statement last week, that the budget for this year is £7 billion higher yep. than was being expected back in 2018. At the time of her predecessor, Derek Mackay's last medium-term financial strategy in 2018, he was predicting a budget £7 billion lower than she has in her budget for this year. And that's thanks to the UK government providing more money in its block grant to support devolved spending in Scotland. And yet, what do we see? We see cuts right across the board. Ah, sorry, Michelle Thompson. I'll give Michelle way. Thompson. I, I thank, him for, thank you for uh, giving way on that point. I suppose I continue to wonder, when I was growing up, uh, Scottish Conservatives would talk often about taking accountability and responsibility for creating their own future. Why is it uniquely now that the best Scotland can hope for is going cap in hand to Boris Johnston and asking for, for more money rather than creating a better future? What on earth happened to the Tories? Murdo Fraser. Presiding officer, that's a brilliantly timed intervention. Because I'm going on to talk precisely about what the SNP have done with the devolved tax powers, the extensive devolved tax powers that they have. And we know, we know that the tax receipts are not performing as well as hoped. Despite uh, the, the SNP's tax changes are bringing 700,000 more uh, Scots into the 41% higher tax rate, making us the highest tax part of the United Kingdom. But we also know, as we've heard in this debate, that income tax receipts are £400 million less than would have been the case under the old system. Now, this is the party that wanted fiscal devolution. This is the party that signed up to the Smith Commission. John Swinney sat on the Smith Commission, yeah. and they've left us in a worse position as a result. John Mason said the fiscal framework was deeply flawed. Well, why did you sign up to it, Mr. Mason, you and your party, if it's deeply flawed? And Mr. Arthur was similarly disparaging. This is the party that calls again and again and again for more economic and fiscal levers. But when it gets levers and it pulls them, it leaves us poorer and worse off as a result. That's the answer to your question, Michelle Thompson. I'll give way. Minister. 
In a serious point, it was agreed by both the UK Government and the Scottish Government that there should be a review of the fiscal framework, which recognised that it would be a learning process. Does the member not concede that point? Murder Fraser. Well, 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 of course, but you, you might have thought, given that Mr Wright says it's, it's, I think he said, fatally flawed, yep. fundamentally flawed, if it's that bad, why did you sign up to it in the first place, okay. you and your party, Mr Arthur? <laughs> now, presiding officer, we now have to live with the consequences of what we've seen in terms of tax revenues uh, and uh, the block grant. And the, and the consequences will be that there will be, have to be real savings made in public spending. Whole swathes of departments, including justice, education, universities and local governments, will see real terms cuts of 8% over the next four years. For enterprise, trade promotion and tourism, the outlook is even more grim. Cuts of 16% in real terms. Uh, and as uh, Jamie Halcrow Johnson reminded us, some of the acts falls in the very areas where we would expect to see investment to deliver a faster growing economy, such as universities, tourism or on trade, and yet these will see the biggest reductions in spending. Michael Mara made a very fair point about the importance of education, not only as important in its own right, but as a driver for economic success, and yet education is being cut under this budget too. Now, Stuart Macmillan, in his intervention earlier, talked about the jobs that have been saved at Ferguson Marine. What he didn't say is that it's been estimated that up to 40,000 jobs could be lost under the spending review that we've seen announced, although ministers are claiming no compulsory redundancies. There's even been suggestions the public sector could move to a four-day week, but get their salaries cut by 20% as a consequence. Little wonder there's been a furious reaction from the trade unions, with unison threatening strike action if the Scottish Government doesn't rethink its plans. And as we heard from Douglas Lumsden and Alexander Stewart, local councils will be the hardest hit. Vital services such as bin collections and libraries under more pressure than ever before. It shouldn't surprise us. The SNP government waited until after the local elections yep. before announcing these plans. We might have seen a very different outcome if the voters had known what was coming down the track for them uh, at that particular point. We also see cuts in the capital budget. So we see, we see that motorways and trunk road spending being cut from £411 million this year to £377 million in 2025-26. My constituents are concerned about the impact, I'm sure Cape Forbes are uh, too, what impact that might have on the A9 duelling project, already many years uh, behind schedule. We don't know uh, what's going to come of that too. And yet there's still, in spite of all these cuts, plenty of money for the SNP's pet projects. £20 million being ring-fenced for a divisive independence referendum in 2023, despite everyone knowing that's simply not going to happen. Uh, and it says all we need to know about priorities of this SNP government, that they would divert precious resources to another unwanted referendum rather than support our courts, our universities or our local council. Presiding officer, Scotland undoubtedly needs a different approach. We would want to see a renewed focus on growing the economy, at least in line with the UK average. And that would increase tax revenues to fund local services because these are so uh, important. Michelle Thompson, uh, in our contribution earlier, was asking about why the Scottish economy isn't growing any faster. And yet, as the Institute for Fiscal Studies have pointed out, we're not even matching average UK economic growth at the moment. That's not an issue about macroeconomics. It's an issue about this government here yep. using the powers it has at its disposal Absolutely. to help grow uh, the economy. And there needs to be a better understanding that unless our private sector businesses thrive, our economy won't progress. That means tackling the productivity puzzle with a laser-like focus. And there needs to be constitutional stability, presiding officer, not the endless threat of another referendum hanging in the air. To conclude, presiding officer, the horrendous situation, and it is horrendous, yep. that Scottish public finances now face is not the fault of Westminster. It is entirely down to the actions of this SNP government. For years, they've railed against so-called Tory austerity. Well, now we have a made in Scotland SNP austerity, and they have simply no one else to blame. That is the point made in the motion by my colleague Liz Smith, which I'm delighted to support. Thank you. Thank you.